town halls. We do have ACL and Spanish translations available. So if you need sign language or if you need Spanish translations, we have those available. Um, this is being broadcast live through TVSA. So if you have questions that you would like to submit online, you can send those to SA Speak Up at sanantonio.gov. And I am going to bring up our council member to give some further introductions. Sir? Good evening, everybody. I know we still have a few people coming in. I want to welcome all of you to the, uh, the new Walker Ranch Senior Center in District 9. Uh, we're all very proud of this facility. Uh, and this was a, a product of the 2017 bond project that uh, many of you voted for and passed. And I know you're always good to see the final product come out of all of these decisions that you make as, as residents and citizens and as we make as a council. Uh, I'd just like to take a, a second to see, are there any of the committee members here tonight who worked with me, who represented the seniors in District 9 that worked on this? I, I didn't note anyone, but there was a group of about 15 uh, senior citizens who lived in District 9 who helped work with the city staff and the development department and the construction company and everything to make this happen. And I just wanted to recognize them. Tonight we're here, though, to talk about the 2023 San Antonio City budget. And as you know, every year we go through a process where uh, the city team made up of the office of the city manager and all of the department heads and our executive leadership team sit down in the summertime, usually in July, and they try and determine what are our needs, what are the city's needs for the following year. And they put together a proposal that they then share with us as city council uh, on what their recommendations are. And then we as city council talk with the people in the departments and talk with the heads and talk with the city manager and, and his staff, and we ask a lot of questions. But most importantly, then we come out and we talk to the public, to you, to find out what are your questions, what are your concerns, what are your wants, what are your needs, what can we do as a city in our next budget to go ahead and improve your quality of life. And that's what we hope to do a little bit tonight, is to give you an opportunity to ask questions, to offer suggestions, to make comments on what the proposals are, so that when the city council makes a, a final decision, it has all the input is, that it can get. I want to have all the input I can get from you, the residents of our district, so that the decision I make is going to be a reasonable and responsible decision. And so tonight you're going to have an opportunity, as I said, to ask those questions or make those comments. Uh, we're very fortunate tonight because the person who's going to be presented, presenting is someone I think who has the best knowledge of our budgetary matters in this city, and that's our deputy city manager, Maria. And she is just amazing uh, when it comes to asking questions about what's going on uh, with the city and the budget and things like that. She just pulls them off the top of her head. She's absolutely amazing. So I know she'll do a good job of making this presentation tonight. But also you'll see that there are representatives from several different city departments, including CPS who's here and SAWS who's here uh, and DHS. And I know there are representatives from ACS and SAPD and the fire department. Uh, we wanted to bring together as many resources as we could here tonight so that if you have any questions, we hopefully can address them right away. But if we can't answer those questions tonight, for whatever reason, you will get the best possible answer as quickly as we can get it to you. So at this point in time, uh, I'll be quiet and sit down and listen like everybody else, and I'll ask Maria Villagomez, our Deputy City Manager, to make a presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, Councilman, and good evening, everyone. I'm Maria Villagomez, Deputy City Manager with the City of San Antonio. And before I start with my presentation, I would like to ask the members of the city team to raise their hands so you can see uh, the departments that are here, and they will be prepared to answer your questions uh, that you may have as we, once we conclude with the presentation. So as you may probably recall, we started the budget process for fiscal year 2023 a little earlier this year. In April, we had a goal setting session with the city council where they told us what their priorities were. And we developed a trial budget and a five year financial forecast at the time that was presented to the city council in May. And then we came out to the community and asked questions and feedback on what do you think about this trial budget? You told us what you thought about the, the recommendations and gave us your priorities. And today's presentation incorporates the feedback that we heard from you and also the feedback from the city council. So let me start with a summary of, of the budget. And, and again, this, uh, this are just highlights. It's not the entire city budget, but we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have in other areas perhaps that are not being covered by tonight's presentation. So the 2023 proposed budget, and this is for the fiscal year that begins October 1 and ends September 30th, is built on the priorities of the council and the community. Uh, one of the things that you will see in this presentation is that the proposal uh, gives money back to our San Antonio residents, and I'll explain how we are attempting to do that. We're also investing in retaining and attracting employees. Uh, like any other big employer, we, the city of San Antonio, were impacted by COVID-19. We have experienced a high uh, turnover ratio of employees, so we are making changes within our organizational structure to make sure that we remain competitive. And we're also making significant uh, investments in infrastructure and investing in our communities. So let me start with the community feedback. Um, as I mentioned, we, we did this survey uh, in May through July. And what we heard from the entire city, the citywide results, um, over 11,000 uh, individuals who participated, uh, that is on the left-hand side. And then the District 9 results uh, are right next to it. So citywide property tax relief, police, fire and EMS, streets, parks and recreation, those were the top priority of our community. No different in District 9, we had a total of 927 responses, and those are also the priorities of District 9. So in the balance of the presentation, I will share with you how we incorporated your feedback. So the total city budget, your budget for fiscal year 2023 is $3.4 billion. The three major components of this budget includes the general fund, which is the largest operating budget of the city, is one and a half billion dollars. And this supports most of the services that you expect to see from, from local government, police, fire, streets, parks and recreation, code enforcement, the libraries, Metro Health. Uh, then we also have an area that is called restricted funds, and these funds are restricted either by federal law local ordinances or state law. So just to give you a couple of examples, uh, the city of San Antonio uh, operates the San Antonio International Airport. So any revenues that we collect, like concessions and parking and landing fees, those can only be utilized for the operation and maintenance of the airport. And that is uh, per federal law. An example of uh, a, a revenue that is uh, governed by state law is, for instance, the hotel occupancy tax. For every room night that is used here in our city, those that, that uh, use the, the, those rooms pay a tax of 16.75%. The city of San Antonio gets 9% of that total, and that is invested in our convention center, Alamo Dome, uh, attracting uh, more um, visitors to San Antonio, arts and history and preservation. And those allocations, again, those are per state law. And finally, um, an example of a fee that is governed by local ordinances is a solid waste fee. That is a fee that you pay monthly on your CPS bill so the city can pick up trash and brush and recyclables. And that again is, um, was designed that way by our, our city council. 
The last component is our capital program. That is roughly about $641 million, and that reflects capital construction that we are anticipating to have in the next fiscal year. That includes those projects that were approved in the 2022 bond program, streets, drainage, libraries, new fire stations, police facilities. It also includes our airport project. Now I'm gonna focus a little bit more on our general fund, and this is a 1.5 billion uh, budget that I mentioned. This particular graphic has in the outer circle the revenues that support the general fund, and the inner circle are how we spend those dollars. So the outer circle, as you can see, we start with a CPS payment, uh, that's close to $400 million uh, annually. That makes up 26% of the revenues that come to the city. And the city, as you may know, we are the owners of CPS, as a, and as a return on investment and payment in lieu of taxes, we get 14% of gross revenues. Uh, property tax is another big component of the city's uh, general fund budget, 28.8% 28 or $434 million. And then we have sales tax. The city receives in the general fund 1% of the 8.25% that you pay every time you pay sales tax. And then we have other resources like EMS transport fees, uh, traffic fines, uh, to give you a couple of examples. So those are the revenues. The majority of those revenues are invested in public safety. Police and fire comprises the largest investment in the general fund. Uh, this year is close to 61% of the general fund. And then we have other important services like public works, uh, parks and recreation, the library, Metro Health, municipal court, and other services in the general fund. So now let's talk about the priorities, uh, your priorities and how those were incorporated in the city's budget. So first of all, uh, property tax relief. That is something that the council was um, very vocal during the April goal setting session and made that a priority for this year. And as you may recall, around April, we all got our, our valuation of our homes and values have gone up. So city council wanted to make sure that we were addressing that and Councilman Courage has been uh, very supportive of property tax relief um, since he's been in council. So these are the things that we are doing. Um, the homestead exemption is increasing from what it is today, which is about $5,000 in each of our homesteads to 10% of the value of the home. Now, as you probably know, the city of San Antonio only makes up a portion of your property tax bill. So roughly for every dollar that you pay in property taxes, the city gets 20 cents or 20% 20 of that. So the tax relief that I'm describing is just on that portion of your property tax bill. So homestead exemption, again, increasing to 10%. Um, the disabled person exemption is currently $12,500, and that is increasing to $85,000. Uh, also, the exemption for our residents over the age of 65 is increasing from $65,000 to $85,000. In addition uh, to the over 65 exemption, uh, those individuals over the age of 65, once they get to that age and we apply that exemption, their taxes are frozen. That means that they don't go up as the, the values of, of their homes may continue to go up. So in total, the, the amount of money that the city will forego is $95 million in fiscal year 2023 as a result of this uh, exemptions that I mentioned. Now, um, the, the increment compared to last year is roughly about $20 million more than, than what we had uh, in the previous years. So I'm gonna switch now to another priority. Oh, I'm sorry, and one more um, item on property taxes is that we're also proposing to reduce the city's property tax rate. So the homestead exemptions that I mentioned and the other exemptions apply to all of those individuals that own a home. The property tax rate reduction applies not only to owners of, um, of homes, but it also applies to uh, businesses um, so this is a, a way to balance the property tax relief that is applicable to everyone here in our community. So the reduction on the property tax rate is 1.67 cents. 
Now the next area, which is another highlight for our budget, is what the city manager is proposing, which is a customer energy credit. Um, as I mentioned, as the owner of CPS, the city gets 14% of the gross revenues of CPS. So when we did our mid-year review, we were anticipating that those revenues were gonna be about $35 million higher than the adopted budget. However, because of the summer months, it's been so warm and we have used more electricity, also natural gas prices as are much more higher than than average. And just to give you a sense, typically um, the price that we pay for natural gas is about two to four dollars, and it has increased anywhere between seven to close to ten dollars. I was reading on the paper today or yesterday that is getting close to ten dollars. So our estimate for the entire year, instead of being thirty-five million dollars better than budget, we're anticipating $75 million. So what the city manager is proposing is to give back $50 million of that 75 to the rate payers in two ways. One, allocating $5 million to assist those um, eligible low-income residential customers, and then $45 million accredited to all CPS energy customers. That credit is roughly about $31 in average, and it's based on the July energy uh, usage, which was the month that we uh, experienced more energy use uh, in, in our community. Now, another priority of our community is public safety, beginning with the police department. So what we are recommending in this budget is to add a total of 78 police officers to the San Antonio Police Department. Now these are um, done in two ways. One, um, our crime in San Antonio is higher than it was last year, it's roughly about 12% higher. So what Chief McManus has done is he has commissioned a study with UTSA to develop um, a, a plan and a strategy to address violent crime in our community. We're anticipating that that work is gonna be completed in November. And uh, we are recommending that 50 of the 78 officers are allocated to address some of the strategies that we anticipate UTSA is gonna be recommending. In addition to that, this particular, uh, this 50 police officers are possible because we are applying uh, to the Department of Justice for a grant. The grant is for three years and then the city will pick up the full cost of the officers in year four. But if we do not get the grant, then we should know in September if we get it or not, then we'll add 38 officers. So that's, that's what we're doing with, with that particular grant. We also are opening a new police station in North St. Mary Street in District 1. This was a project that was approved in the 2017 bond program, and we're adding 28 officers to be able to provide supervision uh, for that new facility. We also have in the budget dollars for our collective bargaining agreement, our contract with the Police Officers Association, and we're also uh, recommending to add funds to replace the in-car video system in the police vehicles because it, it has reached their, their um, estimated end of life. Now I'm gonna switch to the fire department and um, what we are recommending is the addition of a medical first responder unit and uh, this particular unit is possible because we are completing a new fire station in the voter of District 10 and District 1, and um, uh, it's fire station 24, so we'll be adding the equipment and six firefighter positions to be able to provide additional service to the community. We're also recommending the addition of a ladder company, which is one of the larger piece of, pieces of equipment of the fire department, and that will include 15 new firefighter positions. And finally, also in the fire budget, we have funds for the collective bargaining agreement between the city and the uh, firefighters association. Now I'm gonna switch to infrastructure, which is another priority of our community. What you see on the screen is the total investment in fiscal year 2023, over $150 million, combination of streets and sidewalks, uh, pavement markings, uh, traffic signals, 
Uh, in this particular allocation is $13 million higher than what we have in the current budget today. Now, just to give you some example of projects in District 9, um, you, you can see them on the screen. Uh, we have a more comprehensive list, and Rasi Husseini from Pueblo Works is here. So if you're interested in what other projects are in District 9, he'll be happy to, to share those with you. Now, the other area that we heard was a priority from our community on the top five is parks and recreation. And we have over 200 parks across the city of San Antonio. So we are investing uh, $7.7 .7 million to be able to do renovations and improvements at 17 of the parks facilities uh, across the city. Also in the parks uh, area, we are continuing our investment on the purchase of uh, easements uh, and the purchase of um, right of way over the Edwards Aquifer so we can continue to protect the Edwards Aquifer. So there's $10 million that is included in the budget. Um, you may recall that this uh, used to be funded out of a portion of the sales tax that was redirected uh, for another purpose. And uh, we had indicated to the community that we would continue the program and we would issue debt. However, because we received more funding this year, as I mentioned through CPS and sales tax as well, uh, we have the cash to be able to do um, the, the acquisitions in 2023 with, uh, with $10 million. So that's what we are recommending. And then we also have some um, enhancements for capital construction that has been completed new facilities in our linear creekways. And finally, $400,000 to enhance our summer youth program. So those were the top five priorities of the community. In addition to that, there were other priorities uh, that were reflected in the survey, not in the top five, but also the city council provided feedback, and that is our continued support to public health. So our public health department has a plan, a strategic plan that is called SA Forward, and this is a five-year investment, uh, and we are beginning to fund that out of the general fund. It's a total of $3.8 million. And also within the health department, we are recommending a partnership with the UT School of Public Health here in San Antonio to be able to establish a, um, the next generation of public health professionals that can help support uh, programs in the city. So the recommended investment is $10 million uh, over five years, and the fiscal year 2023 budget has $2 million of that. Now I'm going to switch to another uh, priority that, that we heard from the council and the community, which is affordable housing. So the 2023 investment is a combination of uh, federal grants, our general fund, and also what the voters approve within the 2022 bond program. So that in total is $136 million that is being invested in fiscal year 23. That will result in roughly 2,500 new housing um, affordable units. Now, we, the five-year investment in, in housing, and this is a combination of the 2022 bond program, federal funds, and the city's general fund, is $316 million. Now I'm gonna to switch to the library, some investments we're doing in our library system. Uh, we have uh, 31 uh, library locations across the city. So we are constant, constantly doing renovations at $3.2 million and we are addressing a parking lot. Um, there you go. <laughs> um, that is included in the budget for us to be able to, to make that improvement to that library. We're also adding one and a half million dollars more uh, for library materials uh, for a total of 6.7 and that is for books uh, and digital materials that our library system um, uses on a daily basis. In the area of human services, uh, one of the things that we were able to do with federal dollars during the pandemic was to address um, homelessness across the city and that continues to be um, an issue that we are addressing. So what we are recommending as those funds have expired is to transition the homeless outreach team in a, in a um, homeless headline that we had implemented in that 2020 and 2021 into the general fund. So that is the $1.3 million that you see there. 
We also, uh, through the federal dollars, we were able to lease a hotel uh, close to, in the downtown area, to be able to provide um, supportive housing to homeless individuals. Uh, the, the fund will expire at the end of September. We are recommending to the council that we continue that operation for an additional six months. Um, so that's the $1.2 million that you see on the screen. Uh, in the human services area, just like this beautiful facility, we are building one in District 4. It's a, a multi-generational center. So what you see, the $816,000 is for the operations and the staffing needed for that particular facility that will be completed in, in 2023. We have half a million dollars for our uh, seniors, uh, or 600,000 in total for senior programming. Half a million is for older adult technology services. It's a service that we started this year. And then $100,000 for a program that is called Seniors in Play. Then the last piece of my presentation is the capital budget. As I mentioned, $641 million is program in fiscal year 23, and you can see the breakdown, uh, the largest component being streets at 213 million. Um, we have drainage projects and parks projects. Uh, also, our airport projects are included in, in the capital budget. This particular slide shows those um, projects that were approved in the 2022 bond program for uh, District 9. And you can see the spending plan uh, for those projects over the next five years. Um, what we're planning to spend in 2023, and typically 2023 is when we do the design, and then we'll start getting into construction in 25 and 26 with um, uh, our estimate to complete projects in 2027. So the next steps in the budget process, um, as I mentioned, we proposed the budget on August 11. We are now conducting meetings across the community to get your feedback. We have uh, work sessions with the council on Tuesdays and Wednesdays to get their feedback as well and address questions that they have. We have uh, two public hearings um, in our schedule, August 31st and September the 8th and then we're set to adopt the budget uh, on September 15. So that concludes my presentation, and we are happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, Alana from our communications team is gonna be passing the microphone around, so that way everybody can hear your, your question. Thank you. And, and I'll start, so we've received two online. Uh, the first is a comment, and then the second is a question. So I'll read the comment first. And the first comment is from Lisa Beaumont, and she's in District 9. And her comment is, please, please, please give to the animal shelters. They really need the money. In my neighborhood, I see a lot of dogs and cats that need medical attention and shelter. Please. Um, the question comes from Dave Ramos, and he, Dave says, in viewing the news, I understand the city is planning on a 7% increase for most employees. The people of San Antonio, many who are on a fixed income, can't afford these types of increases in their taxes. In light of the economic realities that taxpayers face, can this projected increase be reconsidered? Sure, well thank you for that question. And um, as I mentioned, the city of San Antonio, we are a large employer here in the city. We have 13,000 employees. And um, in order for us to continue to deliver the daily services that you expect from picking up trash, fixing potholes, our streets, our traffic signals, uh, we need to make sure that we remain competitive with the rest of the market. So what the city manager is recommending is that we do a um, market adjustment uh, of a minimum of a 2% and then an across the board increase on, on uh, employee wages of 5% and that's the 7% that was mentioned by, um, by the person who submitted that question. So this ensures that we remain competitive just to give you some statistics, um, before the pandemic, the city of San Antonio, again, 13,000 employees, our vacancy rate uh, is about 7%. Uh, 
During the pandemic, we had a peak of 15% of vacancies in the city. So we had to do a series of adjustments uh, to make sure, again, that we remain competitive because we uh, were experiencing a lot of our employees going to other um, um, private industry or uh, other entities because the salaries were higher. So in order to remain competitive, we are recommending this um, adjustment to civilian compensation. Thank you. in positions compared to 7.6 to 7.7 .7, uh, before the pandemic. And you said at the height of the pandemic, we were about 15% of, of hiring freeze. 15% of the positions remained open. Government still functioned fairly smoothly during that time. Why not delete 2% of those vacant positions and use those funds to offset for your community market rate increases. You had said that the 5% overall or across the board was one thing and there was an additional 2%, but the notes that came out said it was 2 to 7% of the uh, market rate increase depending on the job. But on top of that, 7,000 civilian employees Walsh says 244 of them would get more than a 7% market adjustment because the city paid was so far off from positions like plumbers, electricians, blah, blah, blah. Why not contract out rather than the city managing all of these people on essentially making them government workers? Why not contract them out on an as-needed basis? I still have a couple. Sure. Sure. And just to provide some context to, to the question that was asked, um, the compensation that is proposed is the 5% across the board for all civilian employees. This doesn't include police and fire since they have their collective bargaining agreements. And then a, two, a minimum of a 2% market adjustment um, up to 15%. So on the market adjustment, about two-thirds of the civilian employees will get the 2%. Another one-third will get anywhere between a 2% and a 7%. And then 244 employees will get anywhere between 7 to 15%. Some of the positions that are included, as uh, it was mentioned, welders and, and plumbers, uh, were impacted in our uh, metro health department, uh, nurse practitioners, community health workers. Those are some of the jobs that we are seeing much more competition with the private sector and other entities as well. Um, to answer your question, why not contract out uh, some of the positions? The city has a combination of services that we do contract out. For example, the mowing of our parks, that is a service that is contracted out. Some of the janitorial services, like at our libraries, for example, is contracted out. Um, so we, we have a combination of the two. We do do an analysis of what can be contracted out and, and functions that the city is, is uh, better performing uh, for operational reasons. Um, so we do evaluate that on an annual basis. Um, during the pandemic, I'm glad to hear that you, you saw the government was operating smoothly. We had to get creative and prioritize services that we were providing to the community um, to make sure that there was no disruption of service. So for example, we had to um, pay overtime uh, to some of our employees and change some of our schedules so we could do that, but it's not sustainable. We did a survey with our employees, and one of the things that we heard was fill vacancies because we, we, need, we need to get some help. Um, so, so we do look at positions as part of the budget process, and uh, our city has grown, and in order for us to continue to deliver services, those are the recommendations that, that we are making. 
Sure. I think one of the other people go, and then I come back to me. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, hello, I'm Roger Pratt from uh, Alta District 9. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. I'm Roger Pratt from District 9. Uh, I've got three quick questions. Uh, I saw that part of the uh, city budget is going toward the Alamo Dome. Uh, my question is, uh, does anyone know if the Alamo Dome was, was built with any part of city tax money? Or was that privately funded, for example, through the Spurs organization or some other sports organization? I'm, sorry. I'm looking at Troy Elliott that he remembers. He's been in the city longer than I have, so he probably remembers how we. We issued debt for the Alamo Dome, and that was funded partially through, um, through tax and through um, events at the dome itself. So when it was initially built, who funded it? It was funded through hot tax. The hotel occupancy tax. Okay, uh, thank you. That, um, my, my question was, was, and so if it was built with the hotel occupancy tax, then that IE is city tax, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, my second question uh, uh, for Chief McManus is uh, while every <laughs> neighborhood would like to have their own police substation, I'm sure, uh, and I'm sure you get a lot of uh, input on that. At the same time, all of the, the area north of 281 and 1604, especially west of that, uh, is served by the Thousand Oaks substation. Is there any uh, thought and uh, development being given to a substation uh, in the Stone Oak area, and I don't know if uh, Timberwood is included in the city, I'm sorry, I don't know, but if so, there's a large and increasing population in that area, and uh, your comments, sir. Sure, uh, thanks for the question. So there, there's been a lot of conversations about substations, additional substations in the city, um, and up in this area has been one of the, one of the areas we've discussed. Uh, however, it, it's, not in, it's not planned for the immediate future. The ones that we um, have now are, were, were voted in the, for in the bond program, but that's not to say we're finished. I mean, we will look at that in the future. We're, we're up in, in this area of the, uh, of the city. The next one would, would likely be. Uh, the other uh, would be to uh, Ms. Uh, Via Gomez. Uh, if uh, do you, as uh, w watching over the city budget, wait for input from Chief McManus for that? And if so, what are the steps that you would take to fund that? Yes, actually, um, Chief McManus reports to me, so I talk to him just about every day. And yes, I do take into account his feedback as we develop the city budget. And, and um, as Chief mentioned, we have been looking at police facilities across the city. We are in the process of completing a study working with Pueblo Works to identify um, areas of the city that uh, need a police facility as we prepare for the next bond program. So that will be completed um, in the next few months. Okay. Uh, my last uh, question for, uh, not really sure if it's in your a particular area, but uh, concerns uh, this county and city taxes. While uh, you outlined the different uh, areas, the property tax rate, uh, the homestead exemption, uh, those, are, those are good and much appreciated uh, by taxpayers. Uh, my question on one of them is for the property tax rate, 
uh, being decreased from 55 point X to 54 point X um, is only good if appraisals are kept fair and balanced. Uh, so the tax rate uh, not changing or being decreased slightly is, is only of value to homeowners if, for example, if you have a business and you have an item that, is caught, that you sell at $6, you increase the rate to $10, but then give people a 20% off coupon, you, you're still costing them more. So if appraisals go up by the same parallel, even though the tax rate is going down, it still could cost people more. And that's more of a statement, I suppose, than a, than a question. So uh, this evening, um, uh, for Councilman uh, Courage, I have brought, uh, developed, if you will, my own uh, tax proposals uh, for the county and the city to look at, the city being included because, as you said, you have a 20% interest in that. So uh, if Councilman Courage is amenable, I would like to uh, hand that to him this evening. Sure, and, and, and you're correct in what you indicated on values continuing to go up and the um, possibility of even with these exemptions that we are introducing, the people will still pay more under property taxes. However, however, also the state passed a couple of years ago a bill that caps this, the city's ability to recoup revenue at 3.5% of the base value. So even though those values may be higher than that, um, with the new state law that passed a couple of years ago, we are capped at 3.5%. My name is Dawn Bamunde, and I live across the street in Enchanted Village, Harmony Hills. And at this time, I would like to rise and thank our Councilman Courage, Mr. Razi and Ms. Thea Gomez for helping us get this particular issue of getting that Brook Hollow area at the Brook Hollow Library paved for all of us seniors who are going over there not only to use the library but to vote. And um, you have to understand that there were no facilities uh, in the bond for 22, but we got this beautiful new parking lot which will which we will get between 23 and 24 i've been assured by mr Razi at city public works and councilman courage so thank you very much i'm patty gibbons with the greater harmony hills neighborhood association and thank you to the staff for being here please don't leave because i want to meet all of you um, and it's nice to see Chief McManus. I wanted to ask, I, this is not going to be on your budget, and I know how you're probably going to answer it, but I'm going to ask it. Um, our neighborhood, Greater Harmony Hills, which is right uh, around the corner here, as well as Sure Hills and Ridgeview, is under distress from the migrant center that's come up over at 7000 San Pedro. Um, we're seeing a lot of activities in our neighborhoods that we don't normally see um, at this time. So I don't believe that that's in your budget, but I believe that's gonna come up for renewal of the lease of that building. Um, it's problematic on our end in that it was not rezoned to equipped for a very large, what I would call a short-term rental, STR. But um, how, how do you manage to pay for that when it's, and where was that in the budget to begin with? And how, how do you foresee that going forward if Title 42 ends up being um, taken off the table or whatever, and all of a sudden we're gonna continue this program. Is that anything in, that, in this budget or in the current budget or in, on the table going forward? Sure, and just to provide some context, we um, at the city opened this resource center in uh, the beginning of July at a um, facility that used to be a, a um, CPS building on San Pedro. And uh, we, um, before opening the center, we were seeing a large number of migrants being taken to the International Airport and also to the Greyhound Station downtown. So there were times that we would find ourselves with 400 people downtown on the street because they came to San Antonio unticketed and uh, waiting to, to buy a ticket at the bus station. But if they didn't have 
a um, departure date of uh, within a certain number of hours, the bus station wouldn't allow them to remain there, so they wouldn't end up being on, on the streets of downtown. Uh, in addition to that, as I mentioned, we were seeing a large number of individuals being dropped off at the uh, airport. So what we recommended to the city council was to centralize the work that was being done by nonprofit organizations like um, uh, Catholic Charities, Corazon Ministries, and, uh, and the Welcoming Faith Coalition that have worked with the city for many years as uh, this issue is not new, but, but is um, something that we have dealt in the past. So the idea was to centralize uh, that processing center in one location. Uh, that location was selected because of its proximity to the airport and also to downtown to be able to transport these individuals. The goal of the facility is to assist these individuals uh, to get to their final destination as they come through San Antonio. Being so close to the border, we are um, one of those cities that have the, the um, ability to connect individuals to other um, portions of the, or other areas in the country. So that item went to council um, for approval to answer your question in terms of how is, is being paid. Is being paid through FEMA, uh, a grant that, that was awarded by, by FEMA. Uh, there are no city resources um, or, or tax dollars, if you will, being spent on that facility, but it's reimbursed by, by the federal government. In that um, council item that we presented to the council and in conversations with the federal government, that uh, funding is through the end of um, this calendar year, December 2022. Uh, uh, so we don't have anything in the budget um, to, to continue those operations. Uh, our conversations with the federal government, again, work to get that funded through the end of the calendar year. Uh, we did experience some challenges when we opened the facility that were, uh, you probably heard on the news or you may have seen it yourself. We had a large number of the migrants that were staying uh, outside the center in the shopping center. Um, so we engage with our internal departments to make sure the area is clean and safe. So solid, the solid waste department is uh, on a continuous basis ensuring that there's no trash uh, in the, around the neighborhoods or around the migrant center and in the shopping center. Uh, we have a uh, um, uh, police presence uh, to make sure that we are patrolling around the neighborhood. And again, our goal is to make sure that um, we assist these individuals as they pass through San Antonio, but also we're not impacting the quality of life of, of our residents. I think we have time for one more question. Well, we also have comment cards available, so we can take a few more questions. Okay, Ellen. okay, is that all right, Council Member? Okay, L let me let this gentleman um, ask a question, and then I'll be right over for you. Thank you. I'm, my name is Gary Gibbons. Uh, my question concerns uh, CPS. A number of years ago, we operated an additional power plant that was known as the Dealey Power Plant. But there was a group that protested and succeeded in lobbying, and we shut down that power plant. It's no longer operating. At the time, it's been reported that that was an, an efficient system, and it produced energy that was sold to the Texas grid. And at times, the ratepayers received up to $150 million. Now, that's a revenue that's just poof, gone. And now we're talking about a $50 million windfall as if this is something valuable compared to what you discarded $150 million per year. In addition, there's now rumblings in some these same circles. They want to shut down the spruce plant. That plant cost a billion dollars to construct and it still has 20 to 25 years of life left in it. And it's going to be done purely for what reason? Because uh, environmentalists are pressuring the city. I, I think that fiscally, we lost Paula Gold Williams because she was concerned with protecting the ratepayers. And she got pressured to move along, move along. I hope that the new management is not going to 
bend the knee to the uh, progressive movement to shut it down. Can you give me any insight into that? I apologize, but I'm not uh, familiar with with that um, particular, with CPS. We, as I mentioned, we're the owners of CPS, but they have their own board, they have their own staff, so um, I, I couldn't answer your question. I'm looking at our uh, finance department who coordinates with them and I'm getting a no, so I apologize. We can try to to circle back with you and maybe get somebody connected with you to um, address that particular question. You had uh, mentioned that the um, city owned that uh, CPS plant and they sold it and now they're leasing it back? You're, you're talking about the Migrant Resource yes. Center, sir? Yes, and, and I, before you answer, the, the question that I actually have is, mm -hmm. my understanding is FEMA is only paying the cost of the migrants. The city is paying the cost of management and upkeep of that facility, which they sold. And they are paying a, a rental income or a, a lease agreement with the current owners of that property. Is that accurate? No, the, the um, FEMA is reimbursing for the lease, for the um, staff that we have in the facility, for the food that is being provided to the um, migrants that are coming through San Antonio. So everything that we're spending in that facility is being reimbursed by FEMA. if FEMA is the one that is paying or doing all of these things. What does the city have any business doing in that? Sure, and, and that's a fair question. From our perspective, having all these individuals on the streets creates a public safety um, concern for us. So we are, again, facilitating the process of these individuals to get to their final destination. Uh, and uh, the, the federal government doesn't provide those services at the local level that we do. Um, however, they are reimbursing us for, for those services. And as I mentioned, we are involving the nonprofit organizations to help us with the management of, of the site as well. And not asking our permission, they're just bringing them. And so if we don't respond, then those people are just walking all over the city without any kind of guidance to get out of the city. So we're trying to save the public from having maybe as many as 1,000 people a day dropped off in San Antonio. How is that working out? Better than it was. Part of the initial part of your talk, you talked about the uh, 50, 75 million dollars coming back from CPS, and there was two things that struck me. One is that I did just some quick arithmetic. There are 1.6, approximately, it's a little less than that, but 1.6 million residents in Bear County and San Antonio. If you assume that there are four people per family. That means that there are 400,000 homes that are being um, charged for energy under CPS. If you take $50 million and you divide 400,000 into that, 400,000 homes or families, you come up with $125 per family, not 31. So I question your math. And the second thing is the city public service, CPS, um, already gives poorer areas a reduction in the rate of electricity that they pay. Is that not correct? So let me answer both of your questions. That if, in fact, the city is giving them a reduced rate, then that $5 million, which should be going back to the people who have been paying the rates, um, is that not the same thing as wealth redistribution by the city? You're taking money away from people who are paying for it 
and giving it to people that you're already giving a reduction in rates to, to and now they're getting the reduction. So first of all, CPS has a total of over 900,000 um, accounts, if you will. So the rate payers of CPS includes not only um, homes, but also um, uh, apartment complexes, businesses, um, large plans like to the Toyota plan, for example. So in total, it's roughly over 900,000 um, rate payers that they have. Um, so the way that we calculated that, that rate is based on how much those individuals paid uh, based on their July bill. We have allocated a percentage uh, to each of those uh, tiers. So you have residential, commercial, et cetera. And uh, the residential piece, that average of uh, $31 that I mentioned is only the residential tier. Uh, to answer your question on the breakout of the $50 million, the $5 million is going to the affordability program. Uh, CPS has an, af an affordability program where they provide assistance to uh, those residents that qualify. So what we are recommending to the council is so the 50 million, we allocate 5 million of that to, those, um, to that particular program. And then $45 million is uh, returned back to, to the ratepayers. We have a question in the back, Maria. Yes. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Stephen Lucky, and I'm uh, happy to be here. I just want to first say that this is a, an amazing building. I've been to a lot of senior centers, so great job. Kudos to you all for uh, the amazing work on this project. Um, also, I want to give compliment to this presentation. I've been to a lot of city meetings, and you all did a great job on this. So whoever put this together, I'm sure all of you all had a part in it, but good job. Uh, makes me proud to be a San Antonian. Uh, thank you for the transparency. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, great investments just looking at this. I saw this earlier in the summer, and so to see this revised presentation, uh, thank you for the updates. Um, we're investing in public safety, infrastructure, parks and rec, metro health, affordable housing, library, human services, and the capital projects, um, all very good. The one that I do have a question about, and um, I'm hoping um, y'all will have an open mind about is the customer energy credit, which is uh, $31 on everybody's bill, um, five million for low income, and then uh, 45 million back to everybody. Um, I, I, my first uh, feeling towards that is I, I don't believe that's the best choice, that we can uh, use $50 million uh, to make impactful projects in our city. Um, if we're getting 14% of the gross revenue, and I'm, I'm not an accounting major, so I might mess this up, uh, which equates to 75 million, um, then 1% would be 5.35 million, so their gross revenue is about half a billion, which is great. It sounds like we have a really good uh, energy company. Um, but I think that us giving back a percentage of their profits or, or gross revenue um, is sort of misguided because they're already increasing their rates um, after they're buying this product wholesale, so they're already creating more profits. And so for us to give them back a percentage of their profits to give the customer a credit as a business owner, you know that you're already marking up your products. So the credit that they're giving us for $31 is maybe only worth like $15 to them. So I think that we can do uh, much better. And I'll personally say that $31 on a uh, credit isn't valuable. But I think the intention is, is, is guided well. I think that y'all are trying to be fair. Right? We just want to be fair. And what are the optics of what do we do with all this money that our company made? How do we do the best? So you know what? We're just going to give it back. But me personally, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of other uh, CPS payers understand that $30 really isn't going to do a lot. And if I could say, hey, I'll give everybody in this room um, $30 back, or we're going to invest in solar panels for this Walker Ranch building at $5 million or $10 million. And we're going to offset all of the energy costs for this building, and it's going to be a net zero or a carbon negative building. right? So we can make impactful uh, projects in existing infrastructure, uh, around sustainability because this money came because it's too dang hot and so we're using our electricity more. So we're being very short-sighted in this investment because we can take this 50 million and we can invest it in renewable energy so that we can offset our energy costs over time because when do we use the most electricity? When it's the hottest. We crank up our AC units. Why are AC units not being uh, ran off of solar energy so that they're not even tapping into 
uh, CPS having to buy more energy during peak energy periods, right? I, the math to me just uh, doesn't, doesn't add up. So another example I'll give you is the Edwards Aquifer buyback program. Amazing. $10 million to buy back land off the Edwards Aquifer. Great. Let's make it $20 million. Let's make it $30 million, right? There's just so much more that we can do with this money, and I think that we need to take this as an opportunity, understanding what's happening with the climate and the public health and how those are connected. So thank you. Thank you for that, and, and thank you for the comments, and we're taking notes um, of all your feedback. Just to clarify, um, CPS is not making money because of this additional revenue. The, the $50 million that we're talking about is revenue that came from CPS to the city of San Antonio, and it's driven by two factors. The, the fact that gas prices are much, my, much higher than, than they typically are, and then the usage of electricity. So, so that is a cost that CPS incurs that is passed to the taxpayer, therefore generating, uh, uh, in this case, more uh, revenue to the city. So I just wanted to clarify that, but we'll take note of, of the balance of your comments. Thank you. Oh, um, my name is Gary Raphael. I was a professor of management and strategy for many years here. Um, my question really uh, bounces off the previous speaker, uh, and that's the wise use of that uh, $35 million. It seems to me that you can either spend money or invest it. And if you're giving a rebate, that's just spending it. There's no return on the investment. I think a better return would be in some sort of winterization program where those people that you're giving assistance to are going to be using less energy and be able to pay their bills. Uh, and so it's just a question of let's be wise with a windfall that's going to give us a return on our investment. Right, and, and the, the um, logic behind giving the money back to the taxpayer, understanding where um, everybody sat financially, the impact that, financial impact that all of us have seen. Um, our proposal is to give that back to the community that means something to those individuals that pay uh, for those fees, uh, for, for the CPS um, electrical bills. But we understand your feedback and we'll make note of, of those comments as we compile all of the feedback that we're getting across the city. Thank you. Of course, of course. Uh, on, the ma on the whole, now clearly there are some, but if you look across the city, $30 is not going to be that big a deal. But it's sure going to be a big deal in the long term if you change people's lives by reducing their energy costs. Thank you. All right, I think we are ready to wrap it up. If you still have further comments, we have comment cards at the table outside, and I'm going to pass it back over to Councilmember Courage. Thank you, Maria. And thank all of you for being here. Uh, I want to introduce some of my staff members who are here. In case any of you have any questions from my office, I'll be here for a while longer. But uh, we have Ryder Billow, who does a lot of communications. If any of you get our emails or newsletters, uh, Ryder does that. And uh, then my chief of staff, Derek Roberts, here. He has been involved in, in city government for 13, 14, 15 years, so he knows a lot, too. Of course, there are leaders from a lot of the different city departments who are here, too. And so I want to thank all of you for coming out. And uh, I took notes from what every, everyone was talking about, and I know our city staff did, my staff did, too. But I would invite you to talk some more with us for a few minutes if you've got some individual questions. I know Maria will stick around, the, the chief will stick around. Uh, but we want to thank you. This isn't the end of it. There will be more public meetings. You're invited to share more of your thoughts. Uh, maybe something you learned today will trigger something in your mind that you'd like to mention again another time. But uh, I just want to thank you all very much and hope that you learned a few things and uh, that you'll share this knowledge or this understanding with your neighbors and invite all of them to get more involved in the remaining public meetings that are going to be taking place.
So thank you all very much for coming tonight. Visit TexasDrivingWithDisability.com. Hello and welcome to the Global Arts in San Antonio Spotlight on Sister and Partner Cities, featuring today the Torch of Friendship and the Door of Equality. As a world-class art city, one way San